So I'm going to to share with you the the experience uh, that we have, what uh, what we have been doing, and and where we are now, and what we are seeing in in, in this new momentum of um, being worried about the long haulers and some of the post-acute symptomatology and 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 the pathophysiology that may be under this uh, this, this, this complex disease. So critical um, in the context of uh, what we really present and what we are really, you know, sharing in the context of pathology uh, and part of our mandate is to produce a diagnosis and to manage the individuals that uh, they are either suspected or that have the disease. And we do that uh, to, through the, the providing of accurate testing, uh, as well as by doing that and putting together all of the clinical data with our laboratory data to assist in patient stratification, uh, treatment planning, and also monitoring. But we are also supposed to be able to help in understanding the biology, the pathophysiology, the extent of organ damage of the diseases. And it's for the reason that the post-mortem study, the biopsies are, are so critical and when this disease started, we are compromisingly um, uh, brought the team in order to produce as many autopsies as possible to understand how complex this disease is and uh, in order to better guide the, the decision making. And finally, as easy as it sounds, um, one thing is to have data and the other is to percolate from this data knowledge and then manage this knowledge to better manage better our patients. And we have seen a shift in treatment modalities due to um, the different stages of the disease, as well as interesting developments in vaccination that if we have time, I'll try also to summarize and, and share with you some of the thoughts. And this couldn't be done without the participation of so many colleagues and friends. Uh, we have been very fortunate uh, in the Department of Pathology to have a very strong basic uh, research department of microbiology uh, guided by Dr. Palese with colleagues such as Dr. Garcia Sastre, uh, Florian Kramer, Kramer uh, Viviana Simon, clinicians such as Dr. Annie Weinberg and people in the laboratory that have helped us in developing this testing, uh, taking tests that were initially produced in the laboratory of the researchers and immediately translating them into the clinical CLIA certified laboratories in order to be able to produce the next steps. And also the same with in the context of the rapid autopsy program that we have been doing. Um, we miss very much Dr. Mary Folks, who uh, was the director of autopsy and who um, died during this pandemic and uh, who was really an inspiration for, for all of us. So this is the, the virus you have heard probably a lot about uh, this virus, about the SARS-CoV-2 and the disease that produces. But I would like to center in a couple of things. It's, um, it's uh, an RNA virus. Um, seems that uh, the major reservoir initially could be the bats. But what I want to say is that it's a very complex um, coronavirus. It's a, um, a virus that uh, codes for around 30 proteins, 29 proteins. And everybody is talking about the structural proteins, which is the ones that you are essentially see in, in, in this cartoon, which is the spike protein, the envelope, the nuclear protein. But the reality is that before the genetic coding of these viruses produces and translates these specific proteins, there are another, you know, 20 something that as only maturely we are studying and we are realizing how critical they are. <clears throat> Several of them uh, inhibit the interferon the signaling, which means that they don't allow some cells to uh, produce the kind of infectivity. Um, some of them, like the, the non-structural protein 8, brings down the HLA, meaning that um, the cell is almost like a phantom, it cannot present antigens, as I'm going to share with you in a moment. And all of that has produced break havoc in a disease that has been uh, so anxiety provoking and, and so difficult because essentially produces an asymptomatic spread. Many of the individuals, when they present, they don't have fever, they don't appear to be really very sick, but the virus is there and it's really uh, bringing down 
all of these defenses that we have. Um, when you compare this SARS-CoV-2, this COVID-19 disease versus the past MERS and SARS-1, the first uh, acute respiratory syndrome that we saw some years ago, uh, in the first two diseases, over 90% of the patients presented with fever. And it was easy to put, you know, even in the airports, these doors that you go under, and if you have some temperature, it will signaling. And here we are talking about a disease that many people go through, even though they can be at some point very sick, even without presenting body temperature, as I'm going to share with you. And that has been one of the problems of this pandemic, maybe the problem of this pandemic, this asymptomatic spread, that it's produced by the interaction of some of the non-structural proteins. This virus is very smart and knows how to sequester some of our immune system. So very early on, when we saw the disease starting in, in Wuhan, we were worried. Uh, some of our colleagues were already there. They were telling us, this is not a matter of if, this is a matter of when we are going to see an spread. When it went into Europe, we started to be worried and to be prepared. And we decide, contrary to other groups, that uh, as what we do in the laboratory, it's not in general qualitative, meaning yes or no, even though you know, we need to have that for a, for, a, for a fast track sometimes. But we are about metrics, we are about numbers. As a matter of fact, in the electronic medical record, besides the, the, the weight, the height, the age, and a couple of other uh, numbers, most of the numbers populating this electronic medical record of our patients come from pathology, from the values of potassium, calcium, to cholesterol, to this, to that. So we, we are used to, to produce metrics, to produce quantitative assays. So we said we are going to produce quantitative assays from the beginning, not just qualitative. In the context of diagnosis, we said we are not just going to do a fast platform of yes or no, the detection, but also we are going to look for the viral load, for the number of viral particles, uh, because we know that in some other diseases, uh, the number of particles has been critical in staging the patients. Uh, we also said we are going to do the same for the monitoring and for understanding of the kind of immunity that we are producing. So we set up an ELISA uh, uh, assay uh, in order to not only say yes or no, but also to quantitate the amount of antibodies that we are producing in our, in our blood and if these antibodies were really active, meaning that if we had soldiers that could battle and that could win that, that battle, meaning that they were able to identify the virus and kill the virus, what we call neutralization. And since these patients were also quite sick and they had a cytokine release, many inflammatory mediators being produced in excess, we wanted also to have a cytokine panel that could be quantitative. That has helped us a lot in understanding the course and in staging better the disease course and the clinical developments. And finally, as I said, we uh, uncompromisingly started performing autopsies. The first autopsy that we performed was almost a year ago in March 20, one of the first COVID-19 autopsies uh, in, in the United States, definitely together with the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner of New York, probably the first autopsy in a COVID-19 patient. And since then, we have done over 120, actually we are over 130 now, and we have learned a lot about this complex disease that we are going to discuss and we are going to go through together. So let's start in the beginning, and what I like is to present some technology at the same time that I'll, deal, you know, I'll try to link it with the clinical significance. We develop um, a test for the detection of the virus that is based on the molecular fingerprinting printing of the virus. So you guys are at the forefront uh, in the clinical side uh, with swabs uh, that we went from the deep nose now more into the anterior areas as well as in the orofaringe and even in saliva. So we can make things a little bit easier. We take these samples. We need to heat inactivate because they may contain viruses and even though their infectivity is not very large when it's in this media we need to be cautious uh, we inactivate them we extract the rna and then we transfer this rna into pcr plates where uh, the different primers can identify the right uh, annealing and then they produce the amplification curves we have been using several uh, different instruments and different platforms the roach covers it's one of the high throughput and in the high 
throughput, what we can see is that the cases that are flat, meaning that they don't amplify, are the cases that are negative. And in general, after 20, 22 cycles, we start seeing the development of an amplification curve, meaning the detection of the virus. However, as we were doing that, we realized that some individuals started to amplify in cycle number 14, 17, 18, while others were amplifying very late. And that gave us the clue very early on that there were individuals with a very high vital load, with many vital copies for the volume that we were studying, or with very low vital load. And in some other diseases, including diseases that are, are produced by other viruses, such as the human papilloma virus, or even uh, other retroviruses, such as in the case of AIDS, we know that vital load may be significant clinically. And in here, we were one of the first groups to demonstrate that individuals with very high viral loads at presentation that needed hospitalization were patients that were doing much poorly than the ones that had low viral loads, being one of the first uh, biomarkers of potential significance because it was associated with disease progression and even with death. Uh, since then, uh, many groups have reproduced the data and now viral load and the number of viral copies um, uh, are being utilized to further stratify the patients and to see if some patients at front may be more I mean, to be uh, or to need a more aggressive treatment modality because they may be able to, to, to support it rather than just sending them home, which what happened in the beginning, um, and, and just seeing them coming back after a few days being at that point very sick. So now that we have the diagnosis, let's see how we can monitor these individuals. It takes time for our body to realize that uh, there is a pathogen, that there is something that is non-self, uh, and our immune system starts identifying and producing uh, uh, approaches to attack this pathogen, this non-self new development. And it takes three or four days for the these cells to be able to identify that something is going on, to start assembling the machinery that ends up by producing antibodies that they are extremely fitted. Um, and when we were analyzing the blood of some of our patients early on, meaning during the first week, 10 days, uh, it was difficult to identify even levels of antibodies because the first response that usually we have is a response that it's an IgA from our mucosal protection, but it takes around 18, 20 days for the real molecule that is going to attack the immunoglobulin G, the IgGs, to appear and to be proficient. Um, we wanted to have a test that was robust, that was sensitive and specific, and uh, in order to confirm uh, past infections or infections, as well as to produce aerosurvey studies, and to see if in some individuals in which um, their blood was very rich in antibodies if we could obtain these antibodies to plasmapheresis and produce a treatment modality of, of, uh, of giving sick individuals the antibodies from those that have gone through the disease and have produced uh, a, a, an immune response, something that we, we did in the beginning and now we are doing also with hyperimmune serum. In some of these individuals, we isolated the antibody producing cells, we clone these cells, and then we share that with some companies. These companies, what they did is that they cloned the immunoglobulin gene and they selected clonal antibodies that are good weapons nowadays for treating patients that have the disease and that have a more aggressive stage of the disease at, uh, uh, at presentation. And this is how it works. Um, it's based initially in blood, even though we are working now on a saliva uh, uh, test as well, but in general, we have been doing blood studies. You do titrations, you dilute uh, in different concentrations the blood, and then we bring these uh, blood samples into uh, an ELISA plate, a laboratory plate, in which in the, in the bottom of the well, we have put a specific antigens. In this case, it's the S protein which is also the protein that we are using for vaccination. And then we mix it. And if the antibodies are produced, they are going to be attaching into the bottom of the plate. They produce a colorimetric reaction. In that case, it's a yellowish color. 
So when you look at the plates, there are some wells that they are you know, transparent. These are the negative cases and some cases that have different concentrations of antibodies. We look at the, op, you know, at the optical density. We transform that into arbitrary units and more recently into international units. And we can now relate not only that you have antibodies, but to which degree you have antibodies, what is the quantity, you know, the quantity, and if these antibodies are really linked to neutralization. This is a test that was initially developed in the laboratory of Dr. Framer. It has a positive predictive value of 100%, meaning that it's extremely sensitive, and it has a negative predictive value of essentially 100%, over 99%. And we wanted that this kind of robust tests in order to better guide, you know, the serology and the immunity of our community. And in a paper that we published in Science recently, we were able to address three questions. Question number one, are individuals that see the disease capable of producing antibodies? And even though for many the response was going to be yes, we said yes, but no, because some individuals produce high levels of antibodies, but some people produce very low levels of antibodies and they may not be protected. So yes, the majority of people do have an immune response, but some individuals that have other comorbidities or underlying diseases or they are under specific treatments, such as immune suppressors, they do not have a machinery that produces enough antibodies probably sometimes to protect them. Are these antibodies capable of killing the virus? Can they neutralize? And the answer again is yes and no. The majority of people have enough levels of antibodies that we have been able to link these levels to the killing, to the neutralization of the virus. But some individuals produce just partial immunity. And we need to be cognizant of that because they may get infected. And then in this kind of asymptomatic spread, may others also see. And finally, how long these antibodies can be with us. And we started this study um, very early on in, in March, April of the last year. So we have almost a year of follow up. And we have seen that in some individuals, the titers come down. There are a couple of individuals in here in which the titers are coming down. But in the vast majority, the titers have been maintained for a while. And we know that uh, upon exposure, the antibodies come up immediately. We have seen that in individuals that had the disease, the levels went a little bit down, then they got vaccinated and the titers go, you know, uh, skyrocket. And it was important to identify individuals that were able to donate plasma or to produce hyperimmune plasma as well as coronal antibodies, because um, at least when we selected well, the kind of um, rich plasma and coronal antibodies to give to patients that were very sick, we were able to see an amelioration of their symptomatology and definitely was uh, related with uh, a better clinical course. So this is one of the papers that we publish in, in Nature Medicine, proving that uh, hospitalized individuals with the use of antibodies, they did much better than the ones that didn't have it. And it was very important when we give them quite at, at, at front rather than waiting for the individuals to be sick as we're going to uh, discuss in a moment in the staging of the disease. So now that we have talked about the diagnosis, the monitoring, let's talk a little bit about the disease, the surprises, and what it may signify, not only for the people that have the disease, but also for the people that have had the disease. And now we are going to see coming back with symptomatology that it's started to be called the long haulers or the post-acute COVID symptomatology. And I'm going to present two autopsies for you to see how diverse and how complex this disease is. This is the case of a 57-year-old female that uh, came with uh, fatigue, cough, with problems in breathing. The temperature was not really fever. It was, you know, 37.3 centigrades, but definitely the concentration of oxygen has started to come down and look at the markers of inflammation, which are usually in single digits. And in here, the C-reactive protein, it's almost 300. Ferritin, it's almost 780. Uh, the D-dimer. And 
the number of lymphocytes, rather than being augmented, having uh, lymphocytosis, they are really down. This is almost lymphopenia. This patient became quite sick, developed fever after a couple of days of being in the hospital. And then all of a sudden, it started to crash with the saturation of hemoglobin, uh, also all of the uh, additional markers of inflammation. And finally, with the concentration of oxygen that was at the 60% um, and a different disease in the context of uh, a, 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 a cytokine release storm, the patient was unsuccessfully resuscitated and died. And when we look at the lungs, we were surprised in several of the aspects. The lungs have the typical morphology of, uh, of a lung that has um, uh, an acute respiratory syndrome, uh, has cells that they are very atypical. So don't, don't get me wrong, this is a, a sick lung. And it has all of the characters and histopathological characteristics of what we call hyaline membranes. So what happens is that these protein deposits go around the alveoli and don't allow the air to be now transported into our blood vessels. But one of the things that surprised us it was that it was not very inflamed in the context of polymorphonuclears or lymphocytes as we see in the typical pneumonias, as I'm going to show you in a moment. Uh, we saw pathology in these individuals that have mainly a cardiovascular disease in the context of some problems in the fibers of the heart uh, with some stretch, with some uh, little infarcts. And the question was, if we don't see the inflammatory infiltrate in the lung, where this cytokine storm, where all of these um, released of, of mediators of inflammation are coming from? To realize that in many organs, and when we did uh, complete autopsies with the spleen, with the bone marrow, we were able to see macrophages that they were very angry. They were phagocytizing everything that they found. And there is a name for that, which is the macrophage activated syndrome, which by the way, it's typical in some specific diseases, including the, the canonical, the, the classic Kawasaki disease. In some of the patients that uh, stayed with us for a longer period and had overimposed uh, bacterial pneumonia, this is how the lungs look. You cannot even see the alveolar spaces anymore. They are occupied by an extensive inflammatory infiltrate that is chronic and acute with polymorphonuclears, lymphocytes, macrophages. You can sometimes can even identify foci of uh, bacteria. This was a, a gram positive uh, bacteria, which is very different from the lungs of the patients with COVID-19, at least in the beginning of the disease. Again, this diffuse alveolar damage, but essentially, these microhemorrhages and these hyaline membranes and the lack of all of these inflammatory cells that you see in a more conventional viral and essentially a bacterial pneumonia. We were able to demonstrate by electron microscopy that the viruses infected epithelial cells of the lung, that the cells also infected some of the epithelial cells lining in the olfactory bulb and the upper respiratory tract. Um, and we concluded that some of these patients died of um, a difficult disease that was mainly produced by the affectation of the lung, as well as a very uh, acute onset of an activated macrophage syndrome that produced all of these um, cytokine release. And let me just go to the other case. But other patients presented very differently. Even though they may had some kind of respiratory distress, they came with some neurological symptomatology, neuropsychiatric symptomatology that we didn't really expect. This is such a case. This is the case of a 60-year-old uh, male that really came with some shortness of breath and some fatigue, but at the same time, with night sweats, not remembering what was happening with a foggy brain. Um, some of the patients that we have seen and, and, and that we, we then did the autopsy, we realized that uh, they were 
teachers of English that they didn't, they, they couldn't spell anymore. Uh, so we were very, very worried. And look again at the temperature at presentation, 37.1. But look again at all of the markers of inflammation. They are very high. This patient came with this kind of both respiratory but also neuropsychiatric disorders. And it was a much more difficult course of the disease. It stayed in the hospital for over 20 days in which slowly but surely different symptomatology started to appear from respiratory to cardiac, and then to a different plethora of, of, um, of symptoms in different organs that ended up with uh, an asystole and uh, the patient dying. And when we did the autopsy and we went into a specific organs and we were very interested in the brain because of all of this symptomatology, we realized as in this um, uh, section of the um, of the cerebral hemisphere that it was showing us areas of microhemorrhage extensively, but also microthrombi, large thrombi, and a series of thromboembolisms that we were able then to also verify when we did the hematoxylin and eosin staining of the slides of these tissues. And that posed us the question, could it be that maybe in some of the cells of the brain or maybe in cells supporting the brain structure, such as the endothelial cells, the receptors for this virus may be expressed. So the virus can niche in these organs producing the symptomatology. And our group was one of the first, if not the first, to prove that the ACE2 receptors, one of the receptors that the virus uses for infectivity and for penetrating into the cell, was very much present in the endothelial cells of both um, a small capillary blood vessels as well as medium-sized blood vessels, producing this kind of rough surface um, in which then the coagulation cascade can be initiated. And that was important because it could explain some of the neuropsychiatric symptomatology, uh, such the fact that we know that uh, delirium could in part be produced by the fluctuation of um, different cytokines and thromboembolytic episodes that uh, make the neurons signaling and firing differently. And this was identified by our colleagues uh, in the cardiology and by giving um, antithrombotics, as we'll discuss in a moment, we were able to see that these patients did much better. So we realized at this point that this was not just a disease of the respiratory system, but a very complex disease that could affect very different organs because the presence of the receptors that accept these viruses and can produce pathophysiological developments in the brain, in the kidney, and in the blood vessels of specific organs, including the heart. And looking at that, we started to see a different picture. And we made a connection, maybe because of our background and discussions that we had with all of you, that this seems to be more like a cancer in which the disease may start in an organ, in this case, let's say the nasopharyngeal or the lung, cells die, the virus penetrates into the blood vessels and uses the blood vessels to produce a metastatic cascade. We usually ascribe metastasis to oncology, the fact that tumor cells when they become very aggressive and malignant, can penetrate into the blood vessels and they can travel from the origin to produce niches of the disease, local regionally or even at distant sites. But when we teach pathology to the students, we tell them that this is the same process that some bacteria and some pathogens such as the viruses use. The viruses penetrate into the blood vessels, they can circulate, and now we know that they have even receptors where they can attach and produce pathophysiological developments, such as the production of these thromboembolisms, but that can produce you know, the strokes and all of the symptomatology that we were talking about. As I mentioned, the group of Dr. Valentin Fuster was able to uh, produce um, um, a, cl a, a, a clinical trial in which anticoagulation therapy was given to these patients, uh, either prophylactic or therapeutic doses, 
being very much helping these individuals. And now this clinical trial has been moved to over 30 countries. And I think that it's very clear that anticoagulation therapy is important, essentially, not only at the end stages, but even in the beginning of the symptomatology and of the disease. And it's for the reason that we thought that staging the disease was going to be important. Why we stage diseases? We stage diseases in order to bring together what we are learning at the pathophysiological and clinical level with the testing, both for the diagnosis as well as for the monitoring of the disease, and then linking all of that with treatment and therapeutic intervention. And it has proven in different uh, 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 diseases that the staging gives the patient a sense of navigation, gives us, the clinicians, a sense also of uh, managing the patient that it's different, and also for uh, some of the regulatory agencies to have also a, a route map to better guide some of their decisions. So we published that in Cancer Cell. Uh, we thought that was one of the right places because we were comparing also this viral disease to uh, oncology um, and to oncological diseases in the context of this widespread uh, metastasis like and the damage that started essentially in epithelial cells but then went on to involve uh, inflammatory cells endothelial damage and damage in other organs that when uh, reaching very late stages the patient in most of the cases was not able really to overcome the disease. So at this point, we realized that even though conceptualized uh, primarily as a respiratory illness, um, COVID-19 through these different receptors also causes endothelial dysfunction, hypercoagulative states, that together with this kind of macrophage activated syndrome that contributes to this very prominent immunological response an excessive cytokine release can produce um, a multi-organ failure that leads in many instances to the death of the patient. So where are now? Where well, we are seeing the end, the light at the end of the tunnel, of a dark tunnel. We have been able to understand this virus, to attack this virus differently, and vaccines are here to help us. Uh, the vaccines have been generated mostly against the spike protein because it's the protein that protrudes from the membrane and is the protein that our antibodies can recognize as well as our T cells. And some of these vaccines are new. They are not based on attenuated viruses as in the past. What we did is that we took sequences from the viruses that code for some of these proteins and we put them like in little cells, lipid coating microvesicles that then are injected into your arm or into uh, a site of uh, cells that can be infected. It goes into the myocytes, into your muscle. It penetrates and then our cells take this backbone and start producing the spike protein, but without producing the virus. And it's very safe. And this approach has been used for many years. As a matter of fact, Moderna uh, used this approach many years ago also to produce vaccines against a specific neoplastic cancer uh, diseases. And what it used to take years in the context of a conventional development of a vaccine, it has taken now just months to produce this kind of novel vaccines, which are very safe. And if anything, um, even um, more efficacious in, in, in many contexts, as we'll discuss now. Um, and again, don't, don't get full. We have been using this approach in these vaccines in the clinical arena for many years. Um, Moderna and some other groups have been producing RNA uh, vaccine trials in humans in cancer for since 2007, 2008. And we have also been using them in different kinds of uh, pathogens uh, since uh, 2012, 2013 till now. So there is plenty of experience in the development and in the implementation of this kind of vaccination. And they were approved and they were approved based essentially on the fact that when we took a group of individuals that got the right vaccine or the placebo, when followed, 
during the first few days, some of the individuals in both groups were able to get the disease. They were, they, 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 they got contagiated and they developed the disease. But after some 10, 14 days, none of the individuals essentially that had the vaccine developed the disease, while in the placebo arm, people kept being contagiated and having the disease. And these were the basis for the approval. And again, just realize that during the first days after vaccination, you are not completely protected, that you can still be infected. An important, um, you know, little note to, to remember. Different variants have been now identified, but uh, first of all, some of them have not reached the, the New York City. One of them is in the area, but not, not really in the region, but not in the city. But all of them, as much as we can tell, have a spike protein that is still identified by the vaccines that we have right now. So even though you're going to hear about the United Kingdom, the UK variant, which has very specific mutations, or the South African or the Brazil, now there is a new one that is called the New York City variant. So far, all of them uh, have been making some changes in the spike, but no sufficient changes as to seeing that the vaccine may not work. That's not the case with the antibodies. Um, there is a conformational change in one of the variants that produces a conformation that some of the coronal antibodies that we are using in as a therapeutic uh, target um, uh, are not as efficient. And uh, I just wanted to, to, to mention that both uh, the, the what we call the South African and the UK, uh, that based on the kind of uh, um, different codons that they are affected, uh, we call them either Eric or Nelly, are all of them concentrating in the RBD, in the binding side, but not sufficiently, as we said, to produce symptomatology. I mean, and to produce um, uh, the lack of response to the vaccines. And in uh, individuals that had these variants, we have seen that we do produce antibodies that are neutralizing and that the variants are still being identified by immune system. They are not more pathogenic and still antibodies can be produced that have duration. And finally, I just want to share with you some more difficult news. The fact that uh, our group and others have seen that uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus not only can penetrate in the cells based on the so-called ACE2 receptors, but that there is a family of receptors that the virus can use and we initiated a group of studies to find out where these other receptors are located using modern technology. Uh, that it's uh, what, one of the things that we are, again, very fortunate to have in this institution. And we learned, number one, that some of the non-structural proteins, as we were saying, interfere with the induction of an, immu an immune response. And even some of them don't regulate the HLA um, this is a demonstration that the non-structural protein 8 essentially produces a complete annihilation of HLA presentation. And using, again, modern molecular techniques and single cell analysis, we have been able to do the following. This is one of the patients on which we did the autopsy. And we have uh, patients that die relatively soon and in some of these patients, mostly because of respiratory or cardiovascular disease, we have been able to identify the virus either in their nasal pharynx or in their lungs. But the vast majority of patients that stay for more than a week, essentially, we have not been able to culture virus. They have produced antibodies and they are attacking the disease and they are dying of all of the complications as we described when we were defining the autopsies. So what we did is in some of these individuals, we were able to identify the virus and to prove that these are different stages also of the disease. But then we look at which kind of developments are happening when compared to normal individuals and tissues that we have in the bank to realize that the cytokine, that the cell activation, but blood vessel, a series of networks 
and signal in pathways are very much now redistributed and producing part of the pathophysiology that we are observing. But more important, when we did single cell analysis, cell by cell of the olfactory bulb versus the frontal cortex versus some other areas of our brains, we realized that the ACE2 receptor was essentially negative in some of these areas, while some other receptors such as the BCG, the vasogenin, or the aminopeptidase were really very much more prominent, which means that we don't need just to attack the ACE2 receptors. This is a very complex disease that has learned how to attack different organs using different doors of entry, uh, for which we will need to understand further, because it may have consequences for the long haulers. And finally, we take the single cell analysis to put it in the context of histology maps, and we have been able to produce what we call a spatial profiling that helps us in identifying which may be new targets either to use as diagnosis or predictive biomarkers or even for potential new therapeutic intervention. So when you put it all together, this is a disease that we didn't expect in the beginning. One of the major problems of this disease and the fact that it has been a pandemic is that it has produced asymptomatic spreading. We didn't see that in other diseases. Most of the diseases are produced by people that are symptomatic, that they have fever, that they don't feel well, including the regular flu. This is not the case in here. Many young individuals go through this disease without even knowing that they had the disease. But in the meantime, essentially, if they, are have, if they have a very high viral load, they can spread the disease and can make other people very sick. This is not just a disease of the respiratory system. This is a disease that the virus has learned how to use the blood vessels to travel and to niche in different organs to produce a very complex disease for which, if not well addressed, more at front that at the end, our patients suffer the consequences of a difficult course of the disease, multi-organ failure and death. So I'm going to stop in here and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. We have a lot of questions in the chat or just a couple. Um, if you have a question, please feel free to mute. I'm going to start with the chat because they came in before, but uh, Dr. Carl Braun, uh, and if you're going to pose a question, please uh, remember to identify yourself and the department you work in and the kind of patients you see. Um, Dr. Braun says that olfactory nerves appears to be an early involvement of COVID-19. Is it possible that this is a non-vascular pathway to CNS involvement? So we are studying that. Um, we have seen um, in, by electron microscopy that uh, perinurial cells uh, could also be a target of infection. Um, we have not really seen the viruses inside of neurons or glia cells. So um, I think that the jury is still out. But I really believe that uh, that the uh, not only the olfactory bulb and the blood vessels around that can produce necrosis of the olfactory bulb and anosmia, but also the olfactory nerves may be um, uh, a place of uh, niching and pathogenesis. Uh, Dr. Seward's question is next. Do you want to ask Dr. Seward or? You can take it, David. Okay, so um, <laughs> Dr. Seward um, typed in the chat that, you know, you touched upon SARS-related Kawasaki disease in children. Have your COVID-19 autopsy studies revealed any coronary inflammatory involvement such as we see in classic Kawasaki? Yes, we have, um, we have seen that in, um, in, in some of the cases. And um, we have not performed yet um, um, an autopsy in this new syndrome that has been identified in children that goes along with the effectivity of uh, these multiple uh, inflammatory developments, which is a Kawasaki-like disease. Um, but we have seen uh, coronary inflammation uh, as, as, as it's seen in the, in the classic Kawasaki in some of the cases. Um, and we are doing now a project to follow up some of the patients that had uh, comorbidities in the past, and they are doing cardiac biopsies when they are not doing very well, 
and we are start seeing, you know, myocarditis, and we are start seeing a series of new developments that we are validating not only by microscopy, but also by electromicroscopy, as well as with uh, the technologies that I just shared with you. So I think that we are going to, to, to be more worried than before. There is evidence by, by other groups. Uh, we have evidence, but we are trying to make sure that it's the case that uh, not only can affect the uh, coronary vessels, but also maybe the myocardiocytes. So it has been difficult because these vital particles, you just need a few of them. And as you can imagine, electromicroscopy is, you know, sampling something that is very small. But uh, we are now more aggressively ad addressing these questions because also of the long haulers and the, the post-acute symptomatology that we are seeing in these patients. So definitely much to come and, and much to be worried. Um, we have another question in the chat. This is by Dr. Norma Braun, part of our pulmonary uh, department. She's asking, how extensive is the microthrombi? Do these occur in the vessels, in nerves and muscles? We have seen uh, these microthrombi in, in the heart, in the brain. And so far, we have not been able to pinpoint any specific pattern, which is also worrisome, because it seems like it's more random. And maybe that may explain the symptomatology, this neuropsychiatric symptomatology uh, of, of some patients. Um, let me share with you some news. Um, and, and this is just uh, not yet fully documented, but sufficient documentation that some people have started to be worried. And, and it goes as follows. Um, we have seen patients that develop uh, nephrotic syndrome and, and but more, more importantly, we have seen a group now of uh, individuals um, that after the COVID and after some months, they go into anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. And now we are seeing also an increase, or at least some people are starting to talk that we need to be watchful for maybe uh, people dying by suicide. What I mean is non-natural, uh, unnatural deaths produced by the, the, the long haul symptomatology, these foggy brains that we are trying to further understand. So we all need to be watchful uh, of our friends, of our families, of our patients, because this disease uh, may have other ramifications. And we are trying to understand, and we are trying to have biomarkers that can help us in, in better guiding the biology uh, uh, of this very complex disease. I think we have another question in the chat, but uh, I think Dr. Mensa, you want to ask something? I see you muted yourself. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Colas. This is a uh very uh, interesting and insightful. My question is, patients who are asymptomatic uh, might still be having ongoing microthrombotic events that they are unaware of, and all of a sudden come in with a saddle ambulance um, or um, a massive uh, um, CVA. How do you identify, how do we know some of these people who just died at home or got really sick, didn't have COVID, but not the classical symptoms that we are looking for, but more of the microscopic events going on. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, when the disease came to New York, uh, it was on a weekend. I was with my family. Uh, Peter Palese and others called me and they said the first case is in the city and it is actually at Mount Sinai. Uh, why not? No. So, the first thing that I did after talking to some of my colleagues um, in coming, rushing into the hospital was to call uh, Dr. Barbara Sampson, who is uh, the chief med medical officer of the city of New York, our forensic pathologist. And um, together we have been able to put a program where we are trying, because some of these individuals, if they have an autopsy, they are going to be done in a regular academic center. They are going to be done in the office of the medical examiner. So we are now following a lot of autopsies that they are seeing. And we take uh, blood from almost every single disease that arrives into the, into the uh, 
the medical examiner office to see if they have antibodies, because even though some people, as you said, uh, had an asymptomatic process, uh, so they never knew that they were sick. But one of the ways to know it is if they have antibodies in their blood. So we, we are following now these uh, more general autopsies. We have seen, for example, the other day that uh, somebody was driving the car and all of a sudden, you know, went into a tree, had a stroke. Um, and it had several microemboli in the, in the brain. Um, and it was a COVID positive individual, you know, because it had antibodies. So we are going to see these things and new rules and regulations are going to start coming into, you know, into our hospital. We had a very similar case also of an individual that died of a natural cause and was an organ donor, um, but with COVID positive disease still. Uh, so the debate is uh, it's if we can use these organs. Um, there is uh, evidence that uh, a long transplant from an individual that was asymptomatic that died in an accident and the lung was given to somebody who was already sick and needed that the lung, uh, received the COVID positive lung and the disease uh, produced the death of that patient. So we will, we will see ramifications of this disease in many different areas of, of, of our everyday routine work. Um, Thank you very much. We have one more question because of time constraints. Um, Dr. Stuart Greisman from Rheumatology is asking, or he's noting that the pathology is similar to anticardiolipid antibody syndrome with extensive microthrombi disseminated throughout the body. Do you find any other pathologic similarities or differences between both conditions? Yeah, well, definitely the, the you know, as in the case of um, the a macrophage activation and the parallel with the Kawasaki or Kawasaki-like disorders, yes, we are seeing that this um, that uh, this antibody syndrome with you know with extensive uh, microthrombi disseminated and randomly through the body reminds us of that. So, so again, this this virus has learned how to niche in different sites, like autoimmune responses that we see sometimes in some of the diseases, and produce this kind of pathophysiology that again, we really didn't expect when the first cases were described and what was happening in the beginning of the pandemic. I, I still think, and we had a discussion yesterday with several international colleagues, that one of the most uh, significant developments in this context of the pandemic is this kind of asymptomatic spread. And, uh, and we need to be careful because, you know, we don't vaccinate all of the population very fast and we, leave the children behind to say something that the first ones that get contaminated, but they are asymptomatic, they, they'll, they'll, they'll go home and then they'll, they'll make all of the family sick. Also young individuals that they are strong and they have a good uh, immune system. Uh, they may harbor the virus, they may not be sick, but this is where the viruses can produce mutations. And so far we have been very lucky that all of the variants are not with an increase you know, aggressivity and that still they respond to most of what we have at hand today, but that may not be the case tomorrow. Professor Cordon Cardo, uh, thank you again for being with us today and the wonderful lecture and also for all the really fabulous work you've done in this arena. It was really a pleasure. We will hope to have you back sometime to talk Absolutely. about your work in the oncologic field as well, but thank you so much. Thank you, thank you.